Pencil Kings, Pencil Kings, Pencil Kings, Pencil Kings, Pencil Kings, Pencil Kings, Pencil Kings. It basically like draws a very manageable box around your creative act and gives you a like a, a real solid handhold to get moving in your sketchbook right away. Today, we have something a little bit different because there's something to buy at the end of this podcast. Well, not quite yet. In a couple days, Clark Huggins is going to be dropping the Reckless deck, which is a very cool deck of cards that concept artists and artists anywhere can use to come up with truly original ideas. And I did a horrible job of selling it, but I'm going to just turn it over to Clark right now to give you kind of a one minute overview of the Reckless deck so that we can dive into talking more about it, um, why it's cool. Um, he sent me a promo copy and, and I think it's really cool. I've, I've been carrying it around with my bag while I've been traveling and why it can really help you with your artwork, come up with things that you never would have thought possible before. Yeah. So, um, so Reckless deck is an idea that I came up with when I wanted to be creative uh, really, I kind of wanted to get right to the heart of it. I was very busy. I was really pressed for time, and I had a lot of creativity happening because I was working on a, a, another side project. And what it does basically is it's 72 cards, each of which has a different kind of um, idea or image or object or trope associated with science fiction and fantasy art. And it's an it's a randomizer and it's an idea generator and it's meant then to you know you shuffle it draw yourself a hand of three or four cards which will give you a random combination of either weapons or accessories or costume items or physical attributes that uh, span you know any genre between fantasy science fiction horror and steampunk and so the results that you get are really, really eclectic and really kind of a crazy mashup. And then your job is to create a character out of that mashup that um, you, that makes some sense out of out of the hand that you drew. I think that was an awesome way to describe it. But for me, like it didn't quite make sense when I when I saw it and heard about it until I had it in my hand. Oh. There was like an aha moment that when I started shuffling through these and giving myself some some different ideas. That's when the light bulb really came on. It's like, whoa, I wouldn't think of putting wings on this. Like, you just get things thrown at you that you wouldn't normally totally. have. Totally. And it's really funny, you know, as I've taken this deck to conventions, um, you know, all over the place, and I see people, and I demo the deck, and I see people use it, like, you see that aha moment in people's eyes. Like, you, and, it, and, it's, and it's almost like, you can't help but have that aha moment when you start to actually shuffle it, put out a combination, and like the the gears and the sort of like tumblers fall into place automatically. And even people who maybe aren't don't wouldn't consider themselves artists or illustrators, they start to see a picture in their head of how these things all fit together. And so it really for me is it's a you know it's it's a tool. It's first of all like I find it incredibly fun. Um, but it's also meant to be a tool that you can use to, you know, to cut out that 20 minutes of head scratching and scribbling around and what should I draw and is this good enough? There's something about the power of the Reckless deck that basically gives you an assignment that removes the judgment of whether or not this is a good idea or not because really you're just kind of like fulfilling the assignment. It's suddenly about not about you coming up with a brilliant idea, you were just executing this task. And, uh, and in that yeah. way, like, the creative act becomes a lot less loaded and a lot less, like, you know, about you. And it's suddenly about, like, you know, writing, like, paying your bills or vacuuming the room. It becomes this, it becomes a much more mundane, approachable thing to do. I, I love that you just said that because I feel like, when you're not working in whatever it is, like creative industry, that's what you think it is. It's like this bit, like there's, it's tied to you so much. There's so much emotion. But then when you're actually in the industry, it's, you know, somebody is above you and giving you directions saying like, look, 
we need to show these characters taking this action in this environment and it needs to be, you know, if it's a comic book, it needs to be this many panels long or here's the story and, and you just do it. And it, you're not like, oh, it has to be something so amazing. Obviously, you want to do your best work, but um, I, I love how you're able to separate and make that distinction where this kind of takes that edge off for, for everything kind of being on your shoulders yeah. and you're just like, no, just follow the follow the deck mm -hmm. and then be creative within that. Yes, it basically like draws a very manageable box around your creative act and gives you a like a, a real solid handhold to get moving in your sketchbook right away as you know and let's say you have 45 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever like you can get moving instantly as opposed to fishing around in your imagination for you know w wasting a bunch of time looking for a, a hook into something and where did the idea for this come from? You, I think you said you were doing it already for yourself or some yeah, kind of similar so I, process. This is something that I just made for myself in the studio because um, I was working on a – I was actually writing – it was a, a time where things were really firing creatively for me. I was actually working with a grad school classmate of mine. I actually went to grad school for theater. I was a professional actor before coming back to illustration. And we were working on a, uh, a a pilot script. We were working on like a like a TV pilot script, and it was really exciting to be writing like that. And, to, and it was really fun. And it really just had my mind kind of turning. And I I wanted to be painting, and I had very limited time to do it. And I was like, you know, I just want to get to the easel. I don't want to waste a bunch of time trying to come up with the right thing to paint. I want to be painting. And I knew that I had all this figure reference, like leftover from model shoots or friends uh, that had posed for me or previous illustration jobs. And you know, you work on a um, you work on a professional commission. You put those model references together. Either you use one shot or you use a combination of you know a slight variations of the same pose. And usually, you've got two hundred other pictures left over that you could make something else out of. And uh, I wanted to find a way to apply some kind of science fiction and fantasy uh, edge to those just to just to practice and just to get myself to the easel and moving. And I started to think of all the different ideas and tropes and things that you see in, you know, Imagine FX magazine or any copy of Spectrum or any comic book. Or I think that there's a there's a, a sort of world of kind of swirling objects and weapons and things and images that are almost kind of mythological in status because they get used again and again, like the spaceship, the laser gun, the the gun belt, the the you know this the mask, the cape, the robe, all of those things that recur in fantasy and and sci-fi movies and stories and and images. I was like, what if I just you know like what if I just randomized that? What if I didn't stress over what it was going to be, but threw them all in a pile, picked a few out, and then went straight to the easel and started to paint. And it was just as, it was as simple as that? Like you just sat down and, just, you know, yeah, like 15 yeah, minutes later you had... I did it, you know, I did it on, on index cards just to, just to try it out. And what kind of really... I was really surprised at how much fun it actually was and how interesting and unique the combinations of things that I was getting, you know, like I was working with this initial proto reckless deck index card deck and it was just ridiculously fun and i was so happy with the uniqueness of the stuff that i was generating and and like how i i felt like i had never done that otherwise and a lot of the ideas felt pretty legit to me like they felt like you know this is not just yes you can use reckless deck to, to scribble in your sketchbook but you can also generate ideas and characters that are that really hold water you know, you're like, I could do a real painting, like a big painting about this character or a couple of paintings about this character, or I could write a story about this character. And and the quality of some of the ideas that I was able to come up with and my desire to want to continue to hang out with those ideas, I think really spurred me to to realize that this was a, an, a thing that, and I was really surprised to find out there wasn't something like that out there already. You know, like I looked around for this kind of thing to make sure that I hadn't just reinvented the wheel and I didn't, I wasn't able to really find anything. Do you remember what the, the combo was for the first character or creature, whatever it was that really 
allowed you to see like, wow, I, I'm really enjoying this and I want to take this further. Yeah. Do you remember yeah, what that combo was? It's a combination was? I like to come back to actually because it's so bizarre. Um, the card, there was a three card combination of cyborg or like cybernetic or robotic parts was huh? one of them. Another one was Devil Wings, and the third one was Winchester Rifle. And so I love the idea of this, like, kind of demonic, kind of cyborg woman who had, like, a very, very low-tech gun. You know, this, this, uh, this element of kind of the occult or some sort of, like, fantasy element, and then this extremely heavy-duty sci-fi cyborg element and then like a, a really old school analog weapon that to me um those things just didn't they create to me like this triangle of incompatibility that i continue to find really fascinating and really fun to come back to one of the things that i really like about using reckless deck as, as a as a tool is it it c continually creates for me like very fun brain puzzles of anachronism, you know, things that don't fit together stylistically or, you know, in terms of historically or where they li where they should live together. Like it's very disrespectful in that way of what belongs with what. Yeah, I remember going through and feeling like there's been times when I've looked through and I feel like with role playing games, often I'll come up with character or come across character designs. Um, that I feel like doesn't fit. Like they're just like, where are they finding these influences for these things? This is these are not choices that I would have ever made. But then looking through those designs with the reckless deck in mind, it's almost like I can see where, uh, you know, whether or not it suits my taste doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. That's it, my taste is my taste. Right. It's not everybody else's taste. But it it would allow me, somebody who has a specific thing of what I like and don't like, to push way past that to be like, yeah. You have to come up with this this new combo, and that's exactly what happens when you're you know working as a creative professional. You get put into these situations where somebody's like cyborg, devil wings, Winchester rifle, go, and you're like, man, come on! But <laughs> you just you just make it happen because you're a pro, and that's what you do, and you do your best job, and and you move forward onto the next thing. And so I feel like it's amazing training for people who are wanting to get into that field to being given creative problems and then having to solve them. Yes, for sure. Them well. You know, in, in, in training in that way, definitely. And, you know, I also think that a big part of succeeding at this is constantly staying in motion and don't, you know, not letting yourself get, you know, um, kind of blocked or, you know, walled up in some way. And if you do find yourself blocked, that the answer to that is to, you know, try and stay in motion even more, like generate reams and reams and reams of terrible ideas. And it's the pushing through that, that you're finally on the other side of like your 107th terrible idea, find something that you're like, oh, uh, there's something I can, there's something there. I can make something out of that. Uh, and I feel like there's no real other way out of getting getting through a creative block or a creative problem other than to continue to stay in motion. And I think that Reckless Deck does a good job of being a tool that will keep you in motion. So walk me through the next step. So you've got the index cards. You're using it. Is it you're just using it for fun or you're, you're using it also professionally? No, I'm really uh, using it professionally. I was really and, – and I wasn't intending – I didn't make it for that reason. I made it, you know, for my own personal study reasons so that I could basically practice painting without having to come up with a great idea first. I was looking for, you know, an okay idea or a small idea or just a little something to sort of mash together along with some existing figure reference so that I could be at the easel painting more and not generating the perfect thing to paint, basically. And and how long did that go? That process go on for before you, th the idea kind of crept into your mind. This like, wait a second, if I'm enjoying this this much, maybe other people would too. Right, right. And I, you know, and I think that there was a moment where I kind of talked to myself about like, do I keep this all to myself, and just be the guy that comes up with these like really random ideas and have people wonder like how I came up with that, or do I put this thing out in the world and. I kind of held that in my mind and I was like, honestly, I think it's more valuable out there in the world to influence the, the sort of overall 
conversation about these things than it is going to be for me to hide all to myself. And from a business standpoint, I think any illustrator that can come up with any kind of their own IP or any kind of their own sort of self-perpetuating revenue stream, anything that you can do from a business standpoint to do that for yourself, I think is a, is a really good thing because that's just going to buy you that much more time to work on your own art. So how long, how long did you keep it before it went to the next stage? Because I feel like there's a lot of uh, great ideas, I think, that float around. Um, and then I think I was reading this book called Big Magic, and it was saying like the inspiration or the idea will come to you, but it's not necessarily yours, and that it will leave you if you don't act on it soon enough. And she had this really amazing story about how two people had the exact same idea at the exact same time. Um, so if you're if you're listening and looking for a book, Big Magic, I would, I would highly recommend it. Um, but in your case, you've got the idea and you decide, yeah, it does have a place out in the world. It makes a lot of sense on a couple different reasons, for a couple, couple different reasons. Um, how long did it take you to start executing? Because I feel like there's two people, those who, oh, there's three, those who never get anything done. Um, those who, who like seem to get everything done and it was done yesterday, like the extreme executors and then people that like sit on things for way longer than they probably should, but they still do get it done at some point. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, it didn't take long and I feel like, you know, as a card deck, I think that there's tiers of, of levels of difficulty in terms of the kinds of self produced items that you can, that you can pursue. And I think that a card deck is pretty manageable. You know, up from there would probably be a graphic novel, and up from there maybe like an actual art book, and then I think up from there would probably be like an actual board game. Those are all things that I think that you as an artist could undertake to create yourself, and I think that a card deck is is probably the most accessible one of those things. I had some prototypes made by a company called the Game Crafter, uh, and you can find them, you know, on their at their website, GameCrafter.com or whatever. And I just made some prototypes to get from index cards to actual playing cards, and that was even more fun. The shuffling, the handling of that, I liked the tactile nature of of having a real card deck. And so then um, I hired a graphic designer to design the actual card face and the and the card back and a logo, and sought out a, a printer that could do a volume run of them. And our first volume run was a thousand decks. And that didn't take long. Uh, you know, it ended up being a company that printed in China uh, and their prices just were, were, were very um, doable. So we went ahead and did it. You know, um, it, it, was, it didn't, wasn't free. I mean, obviously, it definitely, there was a, a significant initial investment but we were able to manage that. So we didn't do a Kickstarter for the first one because we didn't – Kickstarter is, you know, there's money that you have to put into the Kickstarter to, you know, for your rewards and to buy the swag and the stuff that is going to be your rewards tiers. And, you know, as we started to price it out, we were like, well, this – you know, when you start to take the Kickstarter into account, it raises the price of the the base amount that we need to raise. So why don't we just – if we – can do it. Let's just do it, and we did. So we had the cards designed. We went through the you know that sort of stage of, of um, you know designing, proofing, talking to your designer, perfecting things, and and then uploaded them to the printer. The printer was great in terms of like helping us sh shepherd the project through their you know their hoops, and like a month later we had a giant pallet of card decks show up at our apartment. <laughs> And we, you know, we put up a website, which was a very base model website. Uh, you know, it wasn't, uh, it was, you know, through through Wix, which I actually like as a platform to to actually do websites. And they started selling pretty much right away. Like I think we, the first day they were available, we sold a couple. And the only advertising I had done was at a LuxCon. I brought a prototype to a LuxCon to show people, and then I started advertising just on my own Facebook feed and people started to pick it up. And I, I would have to say that, you know, sales have been not bad, really consistently not bad. I, I, there have been times like that round the Kickstarter where we were selling a lot more and times where we were advertising in Imagine Effects magazine when we would run those, when we ran those first few ads, we had a real pop of, of sales. But in terms of like real serious advertising, we haven't done any. 
you know, that's we, that hasn't been in our budget to like really advertise at a at a professional product kind of level. And this Kickstarter is going to be, I hope, another big push of awareness out into the world as we try to introduce the second volume. Okay, I've got I got a couple questions before we get to the the actual Kickstarter that's coming up next week. Yeah, yeah. I think like I know for myself, and I hope, I hope that I'm not just asking these for myself. That there's other people who have the same kind of mental hangups. Uh, you know, we're visual people, we're creatives. Why would you hire a graphic designer? Because I feel like it's something that you could potentially take on yourself. And and maybe that's just me like kidding myself about my own skills. Um, but I'm wondering what your thought process was, process was there. You know, as an illustrator and as a storyboard artist, I use Photoshop every day of my life. But I use Illustrator like never. So, you know, it, from, and I don't have a – I think graphic designers have a certain awareness of like – what what's cool in terms of product layout and what fonts are you know say say what you know what fonts associate with what and and what fonts live together I don't know any of that stuff you know I, I definitely feel like graphic designer and actual illustrator are sort of side by side but also very different skill sets mm-hmm. and I wanted this thing to have a professional look and I. I didn't want to spend the time learning Adobe Illustrator well enough to execute it myself uh, and in, and still risk it kind of looking a little amateurish. I, I think that the skills are different enough to where I wanted somebody who was really, really good at that one thing to give me the best possible version of it. All right. That's a great answer. Um, the, okay. So the next question I had was um, getting the decks created in China. Mm. I believe that's what you said, right? Yeah. Uh, having lived in China for a long time, I know and have heard horror stories from friends. I know it can be a bit of a crapshoot, but was there things that you did to ensure this? Like, yeah, this is all fine. I don't have to worry. We just have to communicate and things will be and, you know, trust that we both parties know what they're doing and things will be fine. I didn't I found them to be so professional, you know, from the get go and so customer service oriented and you know they had the proofs to me right on time when I was supposed to have proofs. They, they just never gave me any reason to really worry. You know, one of the things that they did do was they said when when they print when they printed the boxes, they accidentally made the boxes a little too big, and there was like a little bit of wiggle room in there for the cards. And they were like, "Is that okay with you?" And I had to say, "You know, no, it's really not okay. That's weird, and I want this to be as you know to to read and feel like a fully professional product." And that felt like kind of a rookie mistake. So I said, you know, we can either add more cards to the deck to fill that out or we can add like a folded up instruction sheet. And they said, well, we'll do the instruction sheet at no charge for you. So they that's how the instruction sheet that comes with the deck was actually born, was out of a mistake that the printer made. Huh, interesting. And I like that instruction sheet and I intend to keep it in the next, you know, in, in the next volume. Yeah, because that was one of the things I thought that it was great to, to get it and understand. I, I wasn't immediately clear. There's a couple things that I wasn't sure, but once I read instructions, every, you know, it's just one page, so everything was very clear. But the quality of everything, like it didn't seem out of place. And if you hadn't told this story, oh. I, I would not be any wiser. <laughs> Excellent. Well, good. Um, one funny story. So uh, while I was going through security uh, a week ago from Canada to the U.S., the security guards, they stopped me and they pulled out the reckless deck of all the things that were in my bag. They opened it up and then they checked it. And I was like, what is this showing up as on the on the security, on the x-ray machine? Because it was on my carry-on bag. But uh, yeah, I thought that was pretty interesting. That is really funny. Um, okay, so let's talk Kickstarter now. Sure. And so you'd been to Kickstarter before. Yeah, we, we uh, did – we, this uh, this March twentieth launch of this Kickstarter will be the the sort of two point of this Kickstarter because we attempted a reckless deck Kickstarter this past fall in September, which ultimately did not fund. So this is our uh, second go at it. Cool, and uh, that's why I love having you here right now, and why I want people listening to get excited because um, it just shows you like Kickstarter is not uh, something that you it's not necessarily easy. Oh man, and, and you it's hear about not these easy. wow. 
yeah, you hear about these big successes and then you kind of just think, well, everything is a success on Kickstarter. It's not. It's like if you start going, it's littered with failed projects or like and projects. I don't even think they were serious projects. Like they have like zero backers yeah. on them. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess like what are you going into this one? What have you done differently so that I feel like we've talked a bit about you know what the deck is and I really want people to go and look at and, and if uh, Reckless Deck is a good fit for you, like grab it. It's it's an awesome product. Um, but I'm also curious from the point of creative people who want to make a product and bring it to life, you know, or and bring it to light and, to a larger audience and getting some of the insights that you've had for like, you know, doing it once and it wasn't successful, but then um, learning and coming back and be like, no, there's something here. Like I can't give up. I have to keep going because I feel like, you know, if we gave up after the first bad experience or you know unsuccessful thing there'd be so many amazing products that wouldn't exist in our world because they're here because people don't give up right. so what are you taking into this next uh the launch that's coming up well as, uh, on as the i 20th? started to realize that, it, that there was a strong chance that it wasn't going to fund um you know i started to continue to do reading and again talk to people who have been on kickstarter before and have had projects fund uh and having to go back a second time is a fairly common thing it's not um, – I, I definitely didn't feel a strong sense of failure around it or a strong sense of shame around the fact that it didn't fund because having to take a second go at it is something that happens to many, many, many project creators. And I, you know, I, I, I think that I, there was a funny phrase that I learned as I was doing this process that it, you know, in, entrepre- in entrepreneurship – there is a, a, an idea that there is, n- there is never failure, there is only postponement. Mm-hmm. So, and that's kind of what this was, was, you know, uh, we did it, it didn't fund. The reasons why I think became really clear after either um, seeing how the Kickstarter was going itself and then uh, speaking to, um, to, a, to a bunch of artists, John Shindahedi, my consultant who, um, who runs Art Order, who you know, and has you've had on your show, uh, you know he's the he's the sort of um, consultant, the, the kind of go-to printing guy. As you know, as John talked about on your show, what Art Order does is basically is like a full-service shop in terms of helping you turn your idea into a physical reality. You know, so if you've got an art book or if you have a calendar or whatever you want to do, you email John at Art Order. And he helps you with the breakdown of logistics of what you need and what that's going to cost. So uh, I was supposed to attend the LuxCon um, in Reading, Pennsylvania this past October, and I couldn't due to a medical situation for my son. Um, so John at the last minute was like, well, you know, I'll just take a bunch of decks up there and have them sold at the art order booth. And while he was up there, you know, he, he was aggressive about asking people, you know, how they felt about the Kickstarter. Did they fund it? Did they not fund it? And Or did they back it or did they not back it? And when, what their reasoning was. And a great many people said that they didn't get involved because they thought that the funding goal that we had set was too high and that it wasn't going to fund. And John was sort of like, well, you realize that you doing that actually perpetuates that thing happening. And they were like, oh, oh yeah, I guess you're right. But that was, you know, there's a lot of... Um, People think a lot of funny things when it comes to the Kickstarter and will they or won't they or what their approach is to, to back or not back a, a, a project. So I guess then, would you recommend setting goals that are too low with the expectation that as long as you hit your funding goal, you're probably going to exceed it? Exceed it. One of the, here's one of the big things that we're changing is with the first Kickstarter, I had all of these different ideas in terms of how to expand Reckless Deck as a brand. And I tried to do them all at once because I was excited about it and I thought that this is a, such a great idea and such an um, exciting Kickstarter in terms of all the options that it brings to the table that people were going to love it. And I, well, whereas I think it did do that, but what it, what it also did was made my funding goal much higher than had I uh, – I, I understand my now. My Kickstarter – breaks apart into pieces really easily. And had I just done one of those things, our funding goal would have been a third of what it was in the first place. And so I set myself up for this like kind of like high stakes poker all or nothing scenario because until you fund, you get nothing. So what we're doing this time is we're doing a lot of the same things. 
but we've put the foot because the first time around I wanted to do volume two, you know, and that was one thing I wanted to do. The other thing I wanted to do was a children's version called the apprentice pack. That's very geared towards, you know, seven or eight year olds to about 12 or 13 year olds. And then I also wanted to introduce a bunch of booster packs that were specific to a particular genre so that you could then customize your reckless deck and focus on the, on the things that you were most into. Like if, you know, if if you were really into post-apocalypse and steampunk, you could pick up those booster packs to kind of like beef up your deck to, in a particular direction that was most attractive to you and that worked best for you creatively. And I think that all of those ideas are great, except that maybe they shouldn't all happen at the same time. And according to like the Kickstarter laws of physics, you really don't want to put yourself in a position to ask for everything all at once. I think that you need to figure out what the most stripped down version of your project is and put that forward, fund that, and all the bells and whistles come as stretch goals after the fact. Because at least then, you know, you may not get to every bell and whistle that you want to, but you might fund your project and maybe get to one or two stretch goals and that's better than not funding. That's that's like a whole world better than not funding. Uh, okay, this all... It's kind of making sense now. Like I've been looking at Kickstarter for a while. I funded a few things, but and, and I've interviewed people. But hearing you speak is helping crystallize some of this and how it works as a as somebody who wants to bring something to Kickstarter. Yeah, you know, look and see if you can break it into parts. Like if it has a sequel, a se- any sort of sequelized version or any sort of like partnered version. You know, look and see if there's a if there's a sort of like very base, you know, Apollo Lunar Lander version of this thing that is its most kind of fundamental core version, and then all the fancy stuff and and the more elaborate trappings. Put that after the funding goal. You know, okay. you, may, you may also find I try to fund everything. You know, all of my expenses I tried to fund them with the first Kickstarter and what. I read about is you may just have to find a secondary source of funding or you may have to, pardon me, find a way to generate that yourself. And so ultimately I had to, you know, put a lot more profits from Reckless Deck. You know, it wasn't, a, it wasn't like a war chest, but it was like a little something that Reckless Deck had generated some, some profit. All of that had to go back in and I had to just kind of suck it up and fund some of that stuff myself in order to get the funding goal as low as we have it this time. Yeah, it, all, it all really makes sense. And I can't wait to see it um, when it comes out on, it's Monday, right, that it comes out? Uh, yes. Monday the 20th. Monday the 20th. At 10 o'clock in the morning, I think, is when we're going to launch it. Um, is there, a, because we're, this podcast is going out before you launch, yep. is there any early bird discounts or anything that you have that people should be looking out for. I always come late to these Kickstarters. Yeah. The, and I'm like, how do people know about these early bird stuff? But this is kind of like one of the reasons. Like maybe you have a secret mailing list, but maybe you can also throw the Pencil Kings listeners a little bone. Oh, no, the, the there will be early bird um, deals. And, there, you know, I think it's going to be the same. A couple of the rewards tiers are just going to be priced lower for the first 48 hours. And uh, that worked out great for us the first the first time we we did this. And so I definitely want to put that forward again because funding right away is something that you really want to do with your Kickstarter project because it changes how Kickstarter handles your project in terms of its algorithms. You know, if you hit funding and then you start to overfund, you, you know, Kickstarter floats those successes to the top. You know, so you run a much better chance of getting featured in their like project of the day or on the front page of their website or on the front page of the particular category that your project is in, whether it's a comics or an art project or, or whatever, you know, getting those good numbers early and then starting to see that number go up and up and up only cre- exponentially starts to create good stuff around your project. More people see it. More people are like, wow, what's this amazing runaway project? I must be a part of it. So I think that, you know, looking at your 30 day period as like, Oh, I have 30 days to fund this thing. I, I found that it's, that's not, that wasn't the model that worked for us. Like you want to try to really stack your project and, and f- so that it funds in the first, within the first two weeks, let's say, because 
you you may find it's not sl- slow a slow steady build towards funding it's like a big burst at the beginning and then a big dip and that's very common to all kickstarters and whether or not you how far you get in that first big push may determine whether you make it over the finish line or not mm mm-hmm. All right, so my final question is, and I, I seem to ask this question a lot because I'm really curious about it, and like I feel like there's so much confidence in your voice and what you're doing. You know, you the deck came together fairly effortlessly. It seems like uh, is that true? Is it, like, in what is what I hear am hearing in your voice and your story? Is that true? Was it really just sort of like a cakewalk? And yeah, you had a little bump along the road. Um, with with the first Kickstarter, you learned some things, and now you're coming back, and you're fine. Uh, but you've been making sales this whole time. Is is it really this easy? I I want to know because I feel like for me, you know, with Pencil Kings and things that we're doing, it's not easy. It's like, I've, some days I feel like it's hell on wheels. I'm just inventing things all the time and coming up with new ideas. But uh, I'm curious from your standpoint and with the Reckless deck, how's it been? Um, it's been, it's not easy. No, this is in particular not easy. You know, like I didn't, I didn't expect to not fund the first time and having to rev the engine back up for the second Kickstarter has been really challenging. Uh, I do, I'm starting to feel as we've gone forward with it more, I definitely feel a lot more excitement building again for it and a lot more confidence that we will, I feel very confident that we've made the changes we need to make, you know, and uh, really the goal right now is to reach more people with it being able to, you know, appear on your show is like a real plus in that column. And so thanks for that opportunity to be able to get more because you really have to kind of bring your audience with you to Kickstarter. Kickstarter isn't this sort of uh, sea of money that people are just swimming in looking to like throw their cash at. Getting people to focus on your on your project and choose your project as opposed to something else is very difficult. And there's so much noise out there in social media trying to do something that really hooks people's attention and keeps people's attention is really hard. Well, any last words? Like any, I want people to go and buy this Reckless deck. For the longest time, uh, I've been trying to make Pencil Kings podcast a platform where people can take their cool ideas and tell other people who, you know, are also interested in cool creative ideas. So what's what's the pitch? What can we do to get people to, to push them over the edge here? Because... Uh, I found too that it's hard to keep people's attention. And if you're sitting there listening and you've got some idea, like listen up because it, this stuff is not hard. And if you want to get serious about it, here's here's exactly what it looks like. It it looks like asking people to take some kind of action. So, what, what's the what's the pitch here, Clark? What do we what do, why do people need they need it? It's not the reckless deck isn't a want. It's not a nice to have. You need the reckless deck. Why do they need it? They need it because it's a really cheap way to add a lot of power behind your creative drive. How about that? I like that. Right. Yeah, I like that. And I, I, like, nearly- I like that you said it was it was cheap. Um, I don't like the word cheap personally. I liked it as very affordable. Okay. But I was honestly very surprised at how affordable it was when I looked at the price of it. It's it's not good. It's, it's very – it's within the reach of anybody. Yeah, it's 15 it's bucks. Not, it's, I priced yeah. it very much as a uh, – like a con- convention impulse buy. I wanted it to be something that there was no reason to hem and haw about whether you should get it or not. If you think it's cool, like, get it. Like, there's no, oh, should I, you know, get a reckless deck or should I fund my kid's college? Like, it's it's just such a sort of no-brainer. If it appeals to you, there's no reason to not pick it up because it's so affordable and it's something you can, like you were saying, carry around in your bag and play with whenever you have a couple of extra minutes, when you're in line, when you're, you know, being held by the Canadian border police as you were. Uh, it's just something that you can just have handy and flip through and maybe it'll spark an idea that you then bring to your easel and make something really amazing with later on. Awesome. And I I just want to, I want to sweeten the pot here a little bit. So my staff hates when I do this, Uh but if you buy the reckless deck from Kickstarter and support Clark in what he's doing and then send me an email and say, like, I, I supported the Reckless Deck. I'll give you one month free of Pencil King. So you can come in and, oh, and go through some of our courses and maybe them use them together with the Reckless Deck. So you've got uh, the Reckless Deck, which is not going to set you back very much. And then you got a free month of Pencil Kings, and we'll figure out how to make that happen. So, yeah, there you go. All, all of your reasons to, to, to 
makes something happen is there and be part of, you know, be part of the Pencil Kings podcast. And what we're trying to do is promote creatives, be part of what Clark's trying to do and is empower creatives. So it's, you're starting to see how it's all these things are kind of feeding off into each other. And then when you have your project ready to go, talk to Clark and tell him like you backed his project and you got the free Pencil Kings month and you, now you got your project and he can give you some advice or whatever it is. Like all these things is kind of just paying it forward. Uh, and it, we're all in this together. That sounds great. Thank you so much for doing that. Yeah. All right. Well, that's it for me. Clark, where can people find you? Where, where's the best places to reach out and um, to, to grab a Reckless deck if they somehow are listening to this off in the future and Kickstarter's done and they need to just go to the website? Uh, where can they go? Uh, they can go to RecklessDeck.com. First of all, really, really easy. You can get a deck from us online. We still have Volume 1 available right now. You know, As soon as this Kickstarter funds and we can place that print order – a month or two after that, Volume 2 should be available in print from our website as well, as well as on Amazon.com. It's there now, and Volume 2 will be too as soon as it exists in, in the real. And uh, for my own personal work, you can find that at ClarkHoggins.com. Awesome. Oh, hey, one more thing I should mention is go to – right now there's a, there's a landing page uh, called RecklessDeckCampaign.com. People can enter their email address in and opt into the mailing list. They'll get alerts about the Kickstarter, and they'll be registered to win uh, uh, some. We're going to do some giveaways as soon as we launch of some Reckless Deck original sketch art by me, and uh, and I think maybe even uh, a friend or two if I can get them to fully commit. But definitely by me, some sketch art available if they and if they enter their email address to opt in. Awesome, and and I love that you're doing that. I see I see a lot of people not doing that. So that's Reckless Deck Dash Campaign no. or just Reckless Deck Campaign. Reckless Deck Campaign, all one word. All right, perfect. So yeah, if you if you want to go and you're the kind of forgetful person, go there, sign up. You'll get the reminder on Monday, so you can go and get the early bird special price. Uh, I, oh man, I'm I'm gonna do it. I, I need to find somebody I can gift some decks to. Yeah, um, but I will awesome. do that. You know, and um, I don't know if this is you know if if I'm pushing the envelope in terms of time here, but I would just want to mention what's cool about volume two is that it really has enabled me to add a lot more fun card ideas that I came up with after I came up with the first Reckless deck. You know, so it's got a lot more of those lights of fancy, really kind of like out there um, inspiring creative cards that create a real picture in your head. Uh, with volume one, like sort of the first version of anything, there's some base stuff you've got to put out there, like sword and shield, and you got to have those. You know, you got to have sword and shield. Now that they're out there, Volume 2 opens up and a whole new opportunity to put, like, very cool, very inspiring, like, kind of crazy cards out there. So that is a little bit of why I felt the need to – that there I needed to put a Volume 2 out there. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Clark. Uh, as usual, we'll have notes for this over at PencilKings.com slash podcast. I'm going to shoot a little video showing you what the deck looks oh. like so you can understand – or do you have a video? No, not like that. That's the, the... yeah. I'll, I'll I'll shoot a video because Clark Clark was nice enough to, to send me a, a deck, and so you can get a sense of what this is and how it works and how you could use it. I think it'd be really fun if you took it to like school and you had some people just sitting around sketching, um, or if you have you know a drink and draw or something like that. Like this, it feels like a really social thing that you can use these cards for. Yeah, so people use it to drink and draw all the time. Mm -hmm. So we'll have that up over at Pencil Kings dot com slash podcast and don't forget on monday to go and check out kickstarter thanks clark yes, thank you very much and thank you guys for listening thanks for hanging in there and supporting this don't demand patience skill years of practice ah, you talk like a fool i would trade a century of practice for an ounce of inspiration